Good morning, and thanks so much for joining us here in this fantastic facility. Um, so Martha's cued me up. Uh, I will see if I can make the clicker work. Yes. So we face big problems in American education. Um, you see here, and these will be familiar to many of you, where we currently rank in international comparisons in math and science. We are down near the bottom in uh, this set of 32 countries, uh, just above Ireland and under Luxembourg in mathematics. Uh, it rank 23 in relation to science. And even in reading, we're 17th out of uh, these 32 nations. Our problems start early. Six out of 10 low-income US fourth graders do not do math at their grade level. It doesn't get a lot better when you look at higher education. Nearly 40% of Hispanic kids drop out of high school. Only 10% complete any degree, even an associate degree. For white kids, you can see on the left, it's under 10% that drop out of high school and 32% of them that complete some degree. We only rank 15th for our college graduation rate out of 26 lead countries. We were first 40 years ago, first to 15th, and we're only at 20th out of about 26 nations for our high school graduation rate, with only 70% of our students completing high school. It's for this reason that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has created a 17-year initiative <laughs> with this ambitious goal of having 80% of high school students graduate college ready with a real focus on low income and minority youth. Um, for some, this has led to the US being described as a dropout factory, uh, where seven out of 10 don't graduate with at least some degree from college. And these rates of attrition are obviously not great for our continuing prosperity or competitiveness in a global context. And so what's going on in our US education system and what might we be able to do about it? Of course, there are many, many facets of our educational problem, and I'm only going to be describing uh, several of those today. But let's just look for a moment at what the prospects are. What could we be designing differently? The K-12 to career, or learning career, for a kid in school is about one million minutes. That's one million minutes in school, and that's a lot of time to learn, and that's only in school, which is just 20% of the awake time of the student. But how do we spend it today? In hour-long classes, with seat time requirements for learning, with largely cookie-cutter, uh, uh, one-size-fits-all curricula, students group by age, teaching by lectures, a paper textbook is the primary learning resource, and with very little data. We don't have much testing feedback. The reports that in the, enter the student information systems are at, at midterm or semester and, and final. Free lunch eligibility, things like that, and mobile uh, devices are often banned. Probably not a lot of opportunity uh, with that existing set of practices today. And so um, we had an opportunity to develop a national education technology plan that was released in 2010 uh, by Secretary Arne Duncan where I had the privilege of working with a cross-sector group on defining a very different vision that I want to say more about today. This alternative vision expressed in this document is learning in an always-on network world, not only in schools, but anywhere and anytime. And this figure depicts a model of learning that's powered by technology, unlike today's classroom-focused instruction, with a single teacher transmitting the same information to all learners in the same way, this model puts students at the center of the picture, empowers them to take more control of their own learning by providing flexibility on various dimensions. There are standards-based concepts and competencies that form the basis of what all students should learn. We now have those. 46 out of 50 states will be using the Common Core standards. But beyond that, students and educators will have diverse options for engaging in learning that's tailored much more to their goals, their needs, their interests. And as part of this model for a 21st century learning powered by technology, we envisioned using large-scale data from online learning systems to improve instruction. As students work, evidence can be collected of their problem-solving sequences, the knowledge and strategy reflected by the information when they select or enter information, 
the number of attempts they make, the number of hints they require, the feedback that they get, and the how they allocate their time, among other considerations. And beyond school learning time per se, mobile devices enable a continual connectedness during the waking hours to learning resources. E-text, the web, social capital, and friends and family accessible face-to-face -face or through networks. So it's possible, we believe, to establish connected learning that bridges in and out of school experiences. It doesn't have to be restricted to curriculum and in the school. There can be learning games uh, by which kids are able to achieve competencies that count in the overall educational profile. Um, it's possible to go extending the learning time in this way. U.S. students spend far less time in class than in many other countries. And low-income students in particular show a very marked drop in math and reading over the summer break, which is only there in the past so that uh, we could have farm labor. We certainly don't have those needs today. In a similar model in the National Ed Tech plan that we talk about is connected teaching, educators have a different orientation as well. They have uh, regular access to data about student learning, visualizations, and dashboards to help them act on the insights that the data provide, and they're connected to their students, but also to professional content, resources, and systems that coach them, that empower them to create and manage and assess engaging and relevant learning experiences for their students, both in and out of school. They're connected to resources and expertise that improve their own instructional practices, and, they ha and that can help them facilitate their students' increasingly self-directed learning. So are we anywhere near this plan yet? Well, no. We still have significant digital divides in device and network access, uh, but also importantly in terms of the knowledge and the social networks for effective practices of digital learning. But there are very substantial private-public partnerships that are underway to facilitate this move toward a connected learning and teaching future of ubiquitously accessible broadband networks that are accessed by mobile computing devices that everyone has have access to. I encourage you to take a, a, a look at the website for the LEAD Commission. This is a group of um, business and academic leaders who have been uh, reporting to the chairman of the FCC and, and Secretary Duncan working on a whole raft of uh, specific challenges ranging from uh, state policies uh, to finding better ways for schools to aggregate their, their markets and do smart purchasing. So all of this sets up the promise of learning analytics. Um, so what, what are learning analytics about? Uh, I like the simple definition from Eric Duval from Belgium. Learning analytics is about collecting traces that learners leave behind and using them to improve learning. Now, the intent here is to enable personalized adaptive learning pathways through online learning systems that can better support learning for everyone through courses uh, that are in learning management systems or MOOCs from learning platforms ranging from the Khan Academy to uh, things like Dreambox Learning or Newton Math Readiness or any one of a number of nonprofit uh, curricula. And learning analytics is all about patterns in prediction, using algorithms to identify the pattern in the data to infer a learner's knowledge, their intentions, their interests, in predicting what should come next and providing the appropriate response or learning resource to advance their progress. It's about recommended learning resources. It's about more engaging and inspiring learning. A lot of people are working on learning games that are tied to these standards. Uh, there's a project called the Glass Lab that the Electronic Arts is running with, of all things, the Educational Testing Service, uh, looking at learning games and mathematics. And can we identify students' difficulties early and provide the kinds of support needed for success to reduce uh, the issues of, of, of dropouts and of boredom? Can we create continuously improvable curricula where learning networks are getting smarter with every click? We can really foresee here large-scale test beds to do experimentation in what we might call comparative pedagogy. There are lots of different perspectives, for example, on how to teach a subject such as fractions in elementary school. Why not put them to the test in A-B testing, much like we see for 
um, enterprise computing. So I want to do a little bit of clarification of what I mean by personalized learning because there have been a variety of alternative terms that have been used in this space in relation to some alternative to the one-size-fits-all teaching that's so familiar. So personalization means that students are given the choice of what and how they learn according to their interests. So there you have adaptive pacing, pedagogy, goals, and interest uh, dr driving things. With differentiation, which is a familiar term to the teacher, they're often taught to differentiate. You have instruction that's tailored to the learning preferences of different learners, the description of the visual learner, the kinesthetic learner, and the like. Individualization, which is a much older term, essentially and just involves pacing, uh, going at your pace through curricula without attending to changes in pedagogy or goals or interests. And it's important to note here it, that both small group and project-based learning can also be a part of personalized learning. This isn't only about an individual interacting with a computer. Um, so in the National Ed Tech Plan, we describe personalized learning as a grand challenge problem. For many of you, this may be a familiar term. Uh, it pretty much launched with Hilbert's address over 100 years ago on a set of major mathematical problems that would be studied for the next century. But it was picked up in, uh, in the early 90s uh, by Larry Smarr and others to define major problems of science and society that led to huge investments in personal, uh, sorry, in high performance computing and communication. And we took some inspiration from uh, Jim Gray's uh, Turing Award address where he defined some properties of grand challenge problems that we think uh, absolutely apply to the challenge of personalized learning. That uh, the problem is understandable with significance, that it's challenging and timely, that it's clearly useful in impact and scale if it's solved, and that it has incremental uh, milestones that we can recognize as progress along the way. And we thought with that perspective that uh, we could characterize a grand challenge problem, which we express in the National Education Technology Plan, in these ambitious terms. We say the grand challenge problem of personalized learning is to design and validate an integrated system that provides real-time access to learning experiences tuned to the levels of difficulty and assistance that optimize learning for all learners and that incorporates self-improving features that enable it to become increasingly effective through interaction with learners. Now, there's, there are a lot of uh, serious problems embedded in this grand challenge problem because such integrated systems would need to discover the appropriate learning resources for some articulated learning uh, goal or interest, configure them uh, with forms of representation that are appropriate for the learner's age and prior knowledge, their reading ability, the language they were using, and select appropriate paths and scaffolds for moving the learner through learning resources with the optimal levels of challenge and support. Now, while we have little pieces of this, there are definitely systems out there to recommend learning resources that a person might like, learning materials that have embedded tutoring functions, especially in well-defined areas like uh, geometry or algebra. And we have learning management systems that suggest sequences of course materials and ways of tracking progress and activity. We do not have systems that perform all these functions dynamically while optimizing engagement and learning for all the learners that might encounter them. And yet such systems are really essential for implementing the personalized learning we called for in, in the national plan. So um, what, what are in student information systems today? Basically a student's name, ID, date of birth, gender, school name, location, attendance, very little gradebook information, but on the courses that they take and their end of quarter and annual grades, discipline records, whether they're eligible for school lunches, library books they take out, some medical information, and individual education plans if they have diagnosed special needs. But that's it, um, 55 million kids, very little data, it could fit in your pocket. Um, with digital learning, we'll be facing a deluge uh, in this K-12 connected learning world with at least five orders of magnitude more data than the slim data that we have today. As learning goes deeply digital, learning management systems become part of the learning technology ecosystem. 
We'll have deep couplings of student interactions with curricular activities, problems and exercises, projects, and so much more data on learning activities and performances and their context than schools have ever had to make sense of before. Other fields have tackled these challenges. There have been enormous uh, e-science explorations and database breakthroughs in biology and health, in environmental sciences, in astronomy, in physics. And we're hoping to attract uh, scientists from these communities to tackle some of the problems of big data in education that we see looming. We'll need education data scientists that have state-of-the-art uh, data science training and tools and theory for the education domain. So how close are we to these opportunities? Um, I want to tell you about uh, something called the Shared Learning Collaborative briefly. This is something you can also uh, enjoy learning more about through the web. This is a, a, a project, soon to be a nonprofit organization, that uh, is inspired by a vision of the Council of Chief State School Officers, a number of foundations, including the Carnegie Corporation and the Gates Foundation, and nine participating states that represent over 11 million uh, K-12 students. It's an alliance of them with a number of content and tool providers that are all passionate about using technology to accelerate the progress of US schools towards personalized learning by creating a set of open and shared technology services that are um, open and non-proprietary. So the, uh, the SLC, as it calls itself, has been working with these states to roll out uh, a shared learning infrastructure uh, that is an open license and non-proprietary uh, software collection that includes a data store, includes middleware, data dashboards to enable diverse learners, including students, to understand their progress. Importantly, learning maps uh, that provide graphical representations of student learning in relation to the Common Core Standards uh, that will be in use in 46 of the 50 states. Uh, an open application programming interface for vendors, both for-profit and not-for-profit, to plug their curricula and assessments into. And this is already an alpha release with some states in pilot mode today. So the data deluge is about to occur. Um, and as a follow-up to the National EdTech Plan, the U.S. Department of Education had our colleagues at SRI develop an issue on the issues an issue brief on the issues involved in enhancing teaching and learning through educational data mining and learning <coughs> analytics. It's a, a great read, very informative. And what you see on the right are several dashboards on classroom level or individual learning progress uh, from the Khan Academy that you might have experienced firsthand, a system in Massachusetts called Assistments that has hundreds of thousands of kids learning mathematics and Dreambox Learning. All of these uh, utilize uh, EDM or learning analytics in some way for improving instruction. So what are the dimensions uh, of the big data in education? I want to make a distinction between uh, computer interactive learning analytics and multimodal learning analytics. Uh, on the first, uh, this is the computer interactive uh, data for doing learning analytics that comes from fine-grained interactions uh, with the digital curricula, work on problems. So it's keystrokes, it's click streams, it's fairly traditional in its um, input mode. And this is already work that's embedded in both research lab and commercial offerings in K-12. Um, it represents for a given student in a given year hundreds of millions of data points. And over their 12 to 13 year period, several billion data points if they're using this curricula in a regular way. Very different than the small data of student information systems today. Multimodal learning analytics, this is much more frontier work, lab-based, is do, using sensors for emotion detection, both webcams and the computers, and also galvanic skin response or other kinds of emotion sensors to detect frustration, engagement, and other learning relevant states in the environment. You can imagine the data privacy issues that this raises, um, but the work is, is already making some rapid strides. So and in this slide, I want to say a bit about what are the kinds of progress, uh, what, what do education data scientists need to be working on to give you some sense of the scientific problems here. So a lot of the problems are modeling challenges. So there's the issue of user knowledge. 
inferring what a user knows by looking at the data of how they interact with the learning environment. It'll drive many decisions in adapting instructions. User behavior needs to be modeled. Are they on or off task? Are they gaming? User experience modeling. Are they satisfied with the experience, bored, engaged, about to quit? User profiling. Collecting the personal data that categorizes learners based on their characteristic properties. This has everything to do with timing, with interest, uh, with knowledge components. Learning domain modeling is one of the areas in which education data science is uh, extremely uh, different than uh, biology or other areas. Here, we have to have an understanding of the chronology of key conceptual development, of learning progressions. A lot of work on learning progressions has helped animate the creation of domain modeling that's used in these uh, K-12 learning analytics, with the work in uh, elementary to middle school math probably being most advanced. There's learning component analysis. The Pittsburgh Science of Learning Center has done a great deal here, teasing apart all the different knowledge components and skills involved in uh, complex reasoning in the discipline. Then, of course, that leads us to uh, personalization and pacing and learning preferences and interest tailoring of content towards the challenges associated with personalization, recommendations, and finally with interactive data visualization systems that will enable not just uh, retrospective but uh, runtime guidance for learners and teachers and leaders, enabling them to see directly how their effort improves their successes. And I wanted to make an analogy here to uh, Ramesh Johari's talk earlier today. He was highlighting that we have an unprecedented ability to engineer the economic transactions, where he talked about the fine-grained matching of market participants. Well, think about learners and learning resources, where he talked about the fine-grained information we'll have about matches. Well, we'll have fine-grained data about outcomes of transactions of learners and resources. So I think there are some important analogies going on between economics and education and markets and learning that we can uh, benefit from. So just as a quick example, um, what you see at the top of um, this slide are figures of learning curves. This is from an re open repository of learner data that was uh, collected in Pittsburgh using uh, intelligent geometry tutor, uh, many, many thousands of students. And it shows a change in student error rates, the y-axis, over successive opportunities to practice and learn, the x-axis. In this case, it's about a geometry concept. The uh, uh, defining the area of a circle is represented on the left. And you'll see uh, the red line showing average student data, the blue line showing predictions from a best-fitting cognitive psychometric model. And so for the circle area and the trapezoid area, the left the leftmost um, uh, diagrams there, you'll see that the error rate's quite high, but that the learning curve dips. Uh, it improves with practice and tutoring. But the learning curve for square area and rectangle area indicate that students had little trouble with that right from the beginning, <laughs> under 10% errors, but they still get a lot of practice, 10 different opportunities. So with such visualization, it, it, it doesn't take a lot of brains to conclude that a redesign would be needed to uh, eliminate the unnecessary over-practice on some concepts and spend the valuable instructional time where it's needed. And so based on these insights from these data, when they ran a randomized control uh, classroom study, they found a 20% savings in student time with no loss in learning or retention. Uh, so this kind of thing, uh, is, is one of the ways in which curriculum design can uh, be improved from looking at these data at scale. Uh, there are also key issues around data operability uh, across learning platforms. So it's not going to work if only Pearson or Dreambox or Khan keeps their data enclaves separate. Right? So learners are going to be interacting in, in classrooms and outside of classrooms with multiple learning platforms, and that's one key reason why the SLC has the designs that it does. Um, nonetheless, there are a lot of uh, pretty important challenges in policy, in, in law, in ethics. Uh, student data privacy and security issues are obviously very uh, pivotal. Students and teachers and educators need to know how data are derived and used and secured. 
Um, these are not uh, unlike uh, data issues in medicine, and uh, uh, this consortium has been talking to a lot of people in medical informatics around approaches to uh, addressing these issues. There are also quite a few uh, laws on the books uh, that are problematic for an online learning environment, seat time requirements. Uh, some state laws restrict data to within the state, so you could never go aggregating data across states, even if the learning environments were elsewhere that kids were participating in. And there, there are, importantly, I want to highlight in this third um, bullet, stereotype risks associated with learner, learner labeling. We know from work in anthropology and other uh, fields that when kids in a classroom are labeled, as having a learning disability or if having some special need, they get treated differently and not always ways that are productive in ways that uh, often don't enable them to rise to the challenges they could if they were not so labeled. Uh, so there's that curse associated with labeling. Well, there's certainly a prospect here of a thousand new labels <laughs> for learner profiles and categories. Uh, and with that, a whole host of, of secondary uh, issues around needing to define roles, around who has access to these data, and training to help overcome uh, the stereotype risks that are, are, are potential in that system. Clearly, there are also new teacher and school leader roles in order to do data-driven decision-making. Uh, school leaders, superintendents, you'd be surprised, are not as, uh, as attuned to reasoning with data as you might uh, hope that they would be. So this is a very active area for companies and startups. It's not um, perhaps a surprise that uh, with all of these new developments and with an increasing infrastructure ready for always on uh, learning and teaching that there'd be a lot of action. And uh, many of these companies are, are based here in the Valley. Um, the National Science Foundation is getting very active in this area and uh, put out a, a, a dear colleague letter requesting uh, grants across disciplines of education, statistics, psychology, computer science to have new uh, uh, projects that would contribute to this uh, potentially burgeoning field. There's an International Educational Data Mining Society that's uh, ha in its fifth or sixth year. While it's largely been restricted to work on intelligent tutoring systems rather than uh, online learning systems broadly, uh, they're starting to open up in their interests. And there is a Society for Learning Analytics Research um, that has, I think, a broader perspective on what this field uh, is and can become. Its forthcoming meeting is in uh, Louvain, Belgium, actually hosted by uh, Eric uh, Duval, who I mentioned. Um, the activity that's occupied a lot of my time since September is convening uh, in a number of different cities a learning analytics work group. Uh, the Gates Foundation and, and the MacArthur Foundation have funded us to bring together um, a multi-sector group of leaders from universities, industry, government, and philanthropy, and work hard to go building the case and the recommendations for accelerating funding for creating the field. Given what I've described to you in terms of the opportunity uh, with the National EdTech Plan vision, with the SLC and the technologies and the learning uh, ecosystem that that's creating, it might surprise you to learn that there are no degree programs in the world in the subjects that I've been talking about. You cannot get a degree in education data science, in learning analytics, or in educational data mining. They simply don't exist. So unless, and universities, we think, will move too slowly without there being new and interesting incentives. Uh, competitions for a new interdisciplinary PhD programs, postdoc training programs, retraining programs from other data science field, graduate training programs, um, and so we're, uh, optimistic from the early noises that we've had from the Gates Foundation and from the National Science Foundation that following uh, our giving of a set of recommendations and reports in the, in the late spring, that there'll be a follow-on uh, with uh, requests for proposals and, uh, and helping us build the human capital associated with getting this field going. Uh, we'll also be scoping priorities and research topics and tools for inquiry and I encourage uh, any of you who might have any interest in this in joining us. We think there are pretty immense opportunities, that there are really important things to be done, that there are hard challenges, and, uh, and, and, and please contribute.